Thank you, Dan. Um, <coughs> sorry, still early in the morning. Um, part of the time, or when we get near the end, we're actually going to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And we're going to divide in the middle, and I'll explain then why we're doing it the way we're doing it and so forth. But you may, and the words will just be up here, so you may want to scoot up to see. Uh, that seemed to be the best way to do it. But if we could have sort of people on both kind of, those of you that are coming now, if you'd sit on this side, that would kind of even things out uh, for when we get to that place. Um, Advent. What do, you, what do you think of when you think of Advent? Well, it's like getting ready for Christmas. It's usually, or it's four weeks of Christmas, uh, which isn't at all what it is, nor how it developed, nor anything about it. Um, so what I'd like to do these uh, next uh, four weeks, as uh, Dan said, we'll be looking at a different carol each week. Today it's O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, next week it's O Little Town of Bethlehem. These are all familiar carols. Uh, this year there's some more obscure ones, but we thought we'd start with ones uh, on familiar territory. Then of the Father's love begotten, and then on the last Sunday, joy to the world. So those are the, those are the carols that we'll be looking at. But um, I want to read something. Well, I want to, we're going to talk a little bit about Advent and where that came from and what the point is, and it's, it's historical, and it's the, uh, theological roots. All of time centers in Christ. Time didn't used to exist I, if you might remember, Stephen Hawking uh, made a comment once in talking about the creation of the world, and he said there couldn't really have been a God because there was no time for God to be. If you assume that God is in time, but God it does not dwell in time. He is apart from time, all of time is about God, and Stephen Hawking didn't realize nor acknowledge that in fact God is outside of time. Time is a sacred thing that God has given to us, and he uses time to remind us of himself. If you look at the Old Testament feasts, if you look at the Passover, uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, God required the Jews to go to Jerusalem, and these were feasts, and in those feasts they were to remember what God had done. The feasts really, we think of feast as food. A feast, a Jewish feast, was a rehearsal for what was to come. And so, again, three times a year, the Lord was saying, I want you to remember what I have done in time. And so, we have this passage in Colossians, which is one of my, you can't have a favorite passage of scripture because there's just too many. But I want you to, I'm going to read it, and I want you to be thinking of the concept of time and how all of time is centered in Christ. And that's part of what Advent does. That's part of what the Christian year does. It points us continually to the person of Christ, his ministry, and his work. Again and again, listen. Christ is the invisible image of is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all of creation. For through him God created everything, and I would parenthetically including time. In the heavenly realms and on earth, he made things that we can see and things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, dominions, authorities in an unseen world. Everything was created through Christ and for Christ. Everything. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all, who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You see how all how Christocentric 
Christ is in creation, in the universe, and in everything. The Christian year expresses the living centrality of Jesus, the source of our spirituality, of our relationship with God, our relation as individuals and in his church. If we look at some observation of the Christian year, and I would just, that phrase, some observation, the Christian year in some sense can go overboard, I would almost say, when you have saints' days, for every day of the year there's some saint. Uh, that's, so that's why it says some observation, a general. And so that's what I propose, just kind of a, a more relaxed, and we'll see historically that's the case as well, is that some observation as an instrument through which we may be shaped by God's saving events in Christ. Then it is not the Christian year that accomplishes our spiritual pilgrimage helps us grow in the faith, but it's Christ himself who is living in and through us as he plays out. Um, when we look at uh, the, the season of Advent, you know, this is easier. I'll just do like I do when I teach. It's easier to stand like this uh, and point. Um, we have the idea of a Christian year, Advent, then Christmas, then the season of Epiphany, Lent, Holy Week, Easter, Pentecost, and then they call ordinary time, and we don't have to, we won't talk about that now. That's actually not ordinary at all. Um, but Advent is kind of the beginning of the year. But what I want you to notice and think about is this is designed like a corkscrew, that each t each time around it goes deeper and deeper and deeper in meaning and understanding. For example, when we think about Advent this year. How does that relate to Advent last year? What was going on in the world last year during Advent? Not much, it seems. This year, oh dear, it's been something else. So that also relates to a Jewish concept of time. They didn't think of time as circular. In other words, we go around again. Next year we do the same thing. Next year we do the same thing. Next year we do the same thing. It isn't like that at all. It's linear. We are going somewhere, we are headed somewhere to Christ's return and the establishing of a new creation. It's a linear concept rather than circular. So when we look at, whoops, where did that go? Um, when we look at Advent, every Advent is different than the Advent it was before. It gives us that opportunity to grow deeper and deeper in our understanding of what Christ is doing in us and through us. Um, we, we could talk about the cycle of light and the cycle of life. Light is, <clears throat> Jesus said, I am what? The light of the world. And so the light concerns the incarnation of Advent, these four weeks prior to Christmas Day, these four Sundays prior to Christmas Day, so it, it, it floats on the beginning. This year it began on the 29th. Last year, the first Sunday of Advent was December the 1st. So that floats. It's just four Sundays before Christmas Day. Then Christmas tide, those 12 days of Christmas, if you will, leading up to Epiphany on January the 6th. Epiphany is actually, we'll just say a word about that, but that's actually much older than Christmas. Uh, the cycle of life then, <clears throat> excuse me, has to do with the death and the resurrection of Christ. See, it's, it, everything is centered in Christ, his ministry, his work, and why he's here. So we have Lent, Palm Sunday, Holy Week, Easter, the Ascension, and Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So this is roughly six months of the year that is Christocentric, that's all about Christ, his ministry, what he came to do, why he was here. And so if we look a little bit then at the historical development of Advent itself. It is first spoken of, uh, mentioned about in the years 380, 385. There was a lady by the name of Igeria who uh, was from Spain, took a pilgrimage to Israel, to, uh, to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and for our benefit, she wrote, kept a diary. And so she wrote about what was going on. And one of the things that was mentioned um, was that they take time, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, during this time, a six-week time, for converts to be prepared for baptism. Christmas didn't exist yet as such. Epiphany 
is, old, as we mentioned, is older than Christmas, but that was one of the primary times for baptism uh, in the early church, the other, uh, the other time being Easter Sunday. And so for the preparation for baptism, they would take six weeks uh, to prepare, but that was sort of the end of what was usually two or three years of preparation if you wanted to become a believer and so forth. So we have this, this mention of Epiphany, at the, and then Epiphany was in the late 200s, so about 100 years after John wrote the book of Revelation, probably in the 80s or 90s, and within a hundred years, then uh, Epiphany, and it was primarily about baptism, and it was roughly forty days um, uh, for the six weeks. Uh, more detail, but we'll skip the details. Uh, <clears throat> roughly beginning November the eleventh, and uh, Saint Martin, he was a bishop in France, and so they kind of called for it that it was his Lent. But the thing about that happens in Advent and in our lives, excuse me, I'll get out of your way here, um, is that God disturbs the world. What would, you th what would you think about that? God disturbs the world forever. How did he disturb the world? In the coming of Christ, uprooted everything. The way that uh, God incarnate, had come and disturbs the world. This is a beautiful painting by an African-American painter in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, Os Osawa Tanner uh, is his name. And uh, of the angel visiting Mary, or the Annunciation, that you will be the mother of the Christ child. Uh, amazing place. But it's disturbing. Christianity is countercultural. We're going the opposite way if you will, of the world. I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with The, the Chosen. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm, you're looking at me like, some of you are. are you f with the, uh, fil it's a film series, The Chosen, and one of their pictures is, always the, is at the beginning, they've got all the fish swimming one way, and then there's a group of fish that are swimming against the current. And that's, that's the point that they're making there is that our life is countercultural. And so for, and Advent reminds us that. But Advent is primarily, particularly this Sunday, is about longing for the return of the Lord. It's not about the birth of Christ at the beginning, but the longing. We're being in somewhat the same place the Old Testament Jews were in looking for the Messiah. We are looking for the Lord's return. Um, but Advent is about different kinds of comings as well. There is the coming, the incarnation of Christ, um, coming the first time as the incarnate Son of God. So that's part of the Advent. There is a second Advent coming into our hearts when you and I become believers in Christ, when Christ enters our heart, is another Advent. And then the final Advent is the second coming, the restoration of the whole created order. Adventus, Latin, is, is for coming. So the, the Christ is coming. So those are celebrations that we're celebrating during the season, uh, these four uh, Sundays. A great quote, uh, C.S. Lewis, if you live for the next world, you get this one in the deal. But if you live only for this world, you lose both of them. Um, that's Advent is tuning our hearts to the next world because we are citizens of heaven as we sit here now our citizenship is not only on this earth our significant citizenship is in heaven and advent the season of advent is wanting to remind us that that's where we're headed now it's say wait a minute i thought we were going to talk about oh come oh come emmanuel uh, we are <laughs> But I wondered at this point, uh, this kind of is giving us a context, and then we'll, we'll delve into the tune. Any questions or observations or comments or anything at this point? Yeah. Is Epiphany, always January 6th? Epiphany is always January the 6th. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't change. On a whatever day, Christmas rotates and can be uh, wherever but it does. 
And then uh, also, the, uh, as we mentioned before, though, Advent always has four Sundays. A couple years ago, Sunday was on Christmas Eve, if you'll remember. And then we had big discussions on how are we going to do the services, or, or when are we going to do it, and so forth. So, that, so it can fluctuate as this year it came, the first Sunday came in November. Yeah. Other comments, questions? Now, it came the next century, in the fourth century. Uh, yeah, Christmas and uh, the first ones were Epiphany, uh, Easter, and Pentecost. Those, those were like in the third century. And then Palm Sunday and so forth came in the fourth century. And Christmas in the fourth century. And there's all kinds of discussions about how we got the date and... And what Christmas, if it was a pagan festival or a replacement, which it wasn't. Um, but, right. Do you know how giving gifts started related to Christmas? I can't remember. Well, the wise men, yeah. Yeah. That, that's later. In fact, I think that's probably much later uh, in the middle. Epiphany was primarily... there. Epiphany themes. One is the is the visit of the Magi, and the the idea in Epiphany is that the gospel is for the nations, for all peoples. Uh, that was one of the themes that uh, we've discovered for the Jews that that it isn't just for Jews, but the gospel Christ is for Gentiles as well. So that's part of the Epiphany. Another aspect of it is the baptism of Christ. Uh, is a theme, and the wedding at Cana in Galilee are the, kind of the three themes uh, of Epiphany and so forth. Other questions? Okay. Let's look then at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Interesting. Um, the text for O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is... There's first kind of descript, uh, inklings of it, I guess, in some form, in the 8th and 9th century, 8th or 9th century, body in there is where it first just the text began to appear. Um, by the uh, 12th century, it had been modified and cut down uh, into f five verses. There are actually more verses than five, but... Um, five verses, and the 13th century, a little more refining of it. By the 18th century, around 1851, the Latin was translated uh, into English uh, for us, and then it was modified again about 10 years later in 1861. Um, I have, uh, afterwards, you're welcome to come up here and look. I've got an old book uh, from 18, it's in the 1890s. Actually, it's not that old. Um, but it has the, the Latin of the seven verses. There are seven verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel that are actually original. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about more where they came from and so forth. But um, then, it, then it was made into a hymn, and then it became English, and we began singing it in the mid-19th century and so forth. Um, what do you notice? Some of you are musical. How many are mu some form of a musician here? Some form. You're not, I'm not going to ask you questions, but you just, okay. You, okay, what do you notice about when you look at, at here that's a little different? What? There are no bar lines. It just, it just goes uh, the whole time. Uh, there are no bar lines. Now, somebody wrote some, some harmony in here, but... Uh, the, so the, what does that tell us? Well, the rhythm uh, isn't like we would normally would look at. Um, okay, we sing it with rhythm, but it, but it uh, originally that's not because it's chant. The chant for a text came in the 12th or 13th century, but it the chant that this is doesn't act, wasn't actually written for the O Come O Come Emmanuel. 
It was for another text. But they put that text, like sometimes we do, what well, we do in church here all the time, where we'll sing a tune, a different tune to a text. Or because a text, because it is metered, it has measures, you can you find a tune that fits the measure, then you can sing that tune to it. Like for Amazing Grace, you can sing a whole bunch of tunes uh, to Amazing Grace, uh, for example. And so there, here are the seven verses. Um, it's a prophetic text looking forward to the coming of Messiah. That's originally the concept that we're working with, who is referred to by various names. Wisdom, they're all referring to Christ. The Lord, the rod of Jesse, the key of David, day spring. Day spring is another reference uh, with the idea of sunrise in the morning at the very beginning, the dawning. Because morning and sunrise is always as often associated with the resurrection or facing east for the resurrection. So that's sort of day spring, desire of the nations in Emmanuel, God with us. Note that they're singing theology. One of the powerful texts that we have, in fact, throughout Advent, we're really singing our faith. We sing what we believe. That's why what, the text of what we sing is so important. It was important in the early centuries because uh, even apostate, heretical theologies that developed promoted themselves through the text. what we sing is so significant and so we have also what is interesting to me is that there are seven titles seven is a key number in Jewish tradition in Christian tradition seven days of creation it's considered the perfect number so there are seven verses that they put to O come and come Emmanuel um, we have what we call the O antiphons O come, O come, Emmanuel is the source of the O antiphons. And you go, what in the world is that? An antiphon is a song. It's a refrain uh, that is sung as part of worship. And it was part of worship for centuries. And so this uh, particular O come, O come, Emmanuel uh, begins on the 17th. Now we're looking back in history. Okay, this is before the Reformation and a part of the Reformation. Uh, so in the Mass, or the worship uh, uh, part of the service, the Magnificat uh, was sung every day on this. Now, the Magnificat is, is that a, f a familiar or unfamiliar word? Yeah, no, could be. Uh, the Magnificat is the song that Mary sang when the angel visited her in Luke. And Magnificat is it's called that because that's the first word in Latin. Uh, but when my soul magnifies the Lord, for, and then she goes on to in great joy in, in Luke chapter 1 and so forth. So before that text was sung in the worship service, there would be one of these verses before and after. So on the 17th of December, there would be one verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And then the next day on the 18th, uh, and this happened at Vespers. Vespers simply means evening, or it's a sunset service. Sometimes we have Vespers. I don't know if we call Vespers here, uh, our evening prayer. We call what? Even song. Yep, same idea. Even. <laughs> evening. And so it's the idea, and they, at, as the sun sets, then there's a, a time of worship then as well. Uh, each verse began with a drawn out O, oh, a longing for the coming of Christ. So in, in the chant, when it, when it started, there would be a long O. Oh. We'll, we'll look at one in a minute, and you'll see that. Uh, but this longing for the return of Christ, that became associated with Advent, uh, in the 4th century in Italy when there's a great deal of persecution for the Christians. And there was a longing for the Lord, please return. Like Paul and Peter and many of the epistles in the New Testament, they're saying, Lord, please come. Please come. The Lord's coming soon. And that theme has, has 
comes out and is sung out in the O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. As early as the 12th century, the text was paired into five verses and the order was changed. The order has been shifted all over the place. And it is even in, in, in different hymnals, you'll notice, the verses aren't, this, aren't in the same order all the time. Uh, that seems to be of less importance. And then their little refrain, Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. That was added in the, uh, in the 12th century. So we got five verses and now we have a refrain. Um, translated into English, which we had mentioned, is the Jewish nature of the text. Now this, when we talk about Jewish poetry, what, it's different than poetry. When you think of poetry, what do you think of? What? Rhyming, Rhyming words that rhyme. Yeah. Jewish poetry is, is not rhyming words. It's ideas. And so you'll have, and you go through the Psalms and you see this really quickly, is that there will be one line and then the next line is a commentary often on the line that just was or it's a contrast. At any rate, it's related to the line and there's couplets throughout. Well, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is laid out that way with that, with that concept. Um, o Root of Jesse, you stand. This would be the, the top part would be the translation of the Latin, which is, was the language all through the Middle Ages, uh, more literal. And you can see that it's, all it is is scripture. All the ideas, all the text. O root of Jesse, you stand as a signal before your people. Monarchs close their mouths because of you. To you all nations shall bow. Come and deliver us without delay. Come and deliver us without delay. And then the translation, or the taking that literal part, and so in 1851, then we're, we're looking, okay, how can we put that in some way that we can sing it? Because the, the syllables don't line up right. The emphasis is just not there. Uh, so, O come, O rod of Jesse's stem, from every foe deliver them that trust your mighty power to save and give them victory or the grave. And so now we get some poetry rhyming so we'll take the antiphon antiphon what, what would you guess that means phon phonics symphony sound contrasting sounds back and forth O come so our first phrase O come O rod of Jesse's stem that's our thought and then a comment on that, our second line of our Jewish poetry, from every foe deliver them that trust your mighty power to save then and give them victory over the grave. And so you have a statement and then a commentary on that statement, either contrast or giving us more insight or telling us why it's there or what it's supposed to do and so forth. Um, this is actually, and af afterwards I mentioned this old book. You're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards. Uh, this has all the seven verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and I took out one page. Well, I didn't take it out. I took a picture of it. Um, and so this, this is the chant that goes. And what you notice, again, is that there's only four lines. Most music that we have is five lines for the staff. Well, there's only four here. And so how do you, and there's no bar lines, but there's a little line here that tells you something. <laughs> and underneath there's this. And so when this was sung, the cantor or, the, or uh, Ron, would, would, Ron would sing this part up to Jesse. And then all the rest of us would join in here. And we'd sing along here. And then this is, a, this is a nice feature. This means, this means uh, that's a clue that we're all supposed to come in, those two things. Here's a little bit of a pause. And then you have this little note, and this tells you what your next note is on the next line. In other words, your next note is going to, they give you a little cheat when you get to the end. So you have a second line, and what do you know? There's the note. On the second line over here, the last little note, and there's the note. So it's helping you sing. 
musicians, uh, 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 well, when we sing, when, you, when we sing a hymn today, okay, you, you look in your hymnal, and you have the line where the melody is, and then you have the, tr the treble clef that has the, the kind of S agar thing on it. And then if you look down at the bottom, the second staff has kind of a C on it. Notice that. That tells you where that note is. The circle line tells you that C is for where that C is. The little C on the, so this is a little music. This is still part of the, part of the deal, okay? Uh, the lower clef has that little C thing that looks, that's called the F clef. And that sits right on the fourth line when you, when you look in your hymnal today, okay? They've done the same thing here. This is an F. It's like the bass clef. The, the second line down, and it tells you that this is the, that's the pitch. So that's, that third line is this. So my first note, and you sing from the bottom up. So if I'm saying, what note do I sing this note? Then I sing this note. Then I go here. Then I go here to there. Then I go there, there, underneath it, up to there and there. And so you just, you sing from the bottom up all the time. And then since this is, this is I won't bore you with any more music stuff, but there's, there is one thing I did want to point out. Uh, you have this little funny little thing here. That's a flat in music because if this is an F, this line is an F, that space is a G, this is an A, and this note here, Above the staff is the B flat. So you're going to have this note. So they, they sing, and this, is, this then is the chant uh, for that verse that we just looked at. And then this is the O key of David. This is the next one. And you'll notice that these note, this part and this part are almost exactly the same. So each of the verses starts the same way. Each of the seven verses. Uh, there is also actually a manuscript which you can come up and look at as well. It's actually on both sides, uh, but you're welcome to look at. Uh, although this one, ha this is a little older because there are five lines to it, so that later on it got added. Um, o key of David, the scepter of Israel, you open and no one shuts. And then you see again the scripture. All of these are scripture. You're singing faith all the time. What we believe, what we believe. That's why it's important to memorize hymns, memorize good hymns. Um, make that, you may want to make that part of, maybe there's some Advent carol that you want to memorize in these next four weeks. Um, but you're putting in the, oh, come now, David, key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home, make safe the way that leads in high. And close the path to misery. O dawn from on high. This is the, uh, the rising in the morning. Splendor of God's light and son of justice. Come and enlighten those who sit in darkness. Straight out of Isaiah. In the shadow of death. And then that was the literal. And then this is the poetic setting of that text. And this is, we'll sing some uh, this aspect. Uh, then, O oh, wisdom from forth, again, the same idea of the text. This is the only one that's an apocryphal, has an apocryphal source. In other words, this is, uh, Ecclesiasticus is not in the Bible, uh, not in the canon, I should say, uh, but in some traditions it is read not for authoritative, uh, but just more devotionally. Anyway, so there's one text, O oh, wisdom come from on high, but even that's out of Proverbs. Uh, and O oh, Adonai, Lord, the leader of the house of Israel, uh, come. And, and so we have the, the actual literal translation of that verse, and then the verse that we sing. Um, the, uh, just a couple more, ruler of the Gentiles, uh, their treasure in the cornerstone that binds them into one. Save those that you formed from dust. All the way back to Genesis. From dust you came to dust you return. So the scope of the text covers all of creation. and takes care of time as well. 
come the desire, bind all people in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrels, fill the world with heaven's peace. Beautiful, beautiful. Then we have the refrain, rejoice, rejoice, shall come to thee, O Israel. When we have that verse, shall come to thee, O Israel, we're thinking, Lord, return, the second coming. But that's not actually the translation. That worked better for the song, so they just kind of fudged a little bit on the, on the meaning. Uh, it actually means, shall be born for thee, Israel. In other words, this is more a messianic phrase. Gaude, gaude, rejoice. Emmanuel, nascitur, prote, born for you, Israel. And so it, it, the this, this song even then is uh, maybe more Jewish than we, would, than we might think. It's for the Messiah to be born for you, Israel. But it's translated, shall come to thee, and so we, it also refers to, for us to the second coming. Now we come to the text exactly, and we have a chance to sing it. O come, O come, and this has all seven verses in it, then rejoice, rejoice. What I'd like to do is that, uh, well, here, let's... Um, Whoops, let's do this. Now, uh, Michael, help me out here. I mute this, and I mute myself.
one more. This is a verse that was added. Somebody made this up much more recently. And you'll tell by the way it sings over and over. <laughs> Conversation. Let's do it. the first verse you have memorized, right? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. I'm going to ask you to do that once, okay? Is uh, can you stand? If you're able, if, if you can't, that's fine. But I want you to stand and face each other. You guys look at you, and you're socially distanced, so you're good, okay? Now, all of you guys are going to look at all of you, and all of you are going to look at all of you, okay? And you're going to sing back and forth, okay? Thank you. There we go again. Uh, you see the difference that, that that makes? Suddenly you're not just singing words. You're having a conversation to each other and to the Lord. And then it's rejoice, rejoice. So sometimes we just sing songs without really thinking all that much. And yet the idea is, is that we are to sing and to think about uh, what we're doing. Oh, you know what? I want to. This is a setting, and we'll conclude our time with this. This is a setting of uh, O Come, O Come. <laughs> Surprise? O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, the guy that's singing, Peter Hollins, sings all the parts. So all the harmony and every sound you hear is him. And then, he, then he's singing the melody as well, uh, and so forth. There. So at the end of each, each of our sessions, I'm going to play. The music is varied, I will tell you. Next week, it's, uh, it's Bill Gaither and, and the uh, quartet singing Will Come, uh, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Uh, so there, there's a variety in it. Uh, but uh, he has produced uh, the whole thing. There's, uh, there's in, on YouTube now, uh, in particular, there's quite a few people that are, that are doing this, some with greater success than others. Um, he, he has particular success. I would mention one other thing, and, and I asked Dan about this, if this, would be our, if this would be all right to do. Some of you are already doing it. Uh, but each year, um, I write an Advent devotional. And so for each day, between now and January the 6th, and then we'll, uh, on each of, well, anyway, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, between now and January the 6th, every morning, and the first one came out this morning, you'll get in your email box, it's free. 
Free, 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 free. Okay? Doesn't cost a cent. At 5 o'clock this morning, I got my first email. And it has a devotional, it has a passage of scripture that's from an, in the Advent mindset that I've written a short commentary on that passage to give us more insight and in, in background and context and theology and what's going on and so forth. And then there is a music clip like this. This is one that I've used in the, uh, in the past. I think it might even be on again this year. There's a YouTube clip of music that deals with what we talked about that day. And then there's a prayer from Augustine or John Calvin or uh, one of the great fathers of the church, and there's some contemporary ones as well, a prayer as well. And then every morning that will show up in your mailbox. And uh, it's, it's very simple. simple. It's just sharpdevotional.com. It's not real complicated. You just go out, you just type that in, and it'll say email, put your email in and your name, and it'll show up tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Totally free, but it's, okay, free, free, free. That's what I want to emphasize. Uh, but the, the whole idea is just to help us, what we're talking about, that Christ is in our life, and the, that we get used to reading Scripture every day. And it isn't just reading, it's encountering Christ, and that's what we talk about, is that we encounter Christ at some point in each day. Having said all that, now be quiet and we'll listen to Peter uh, sing. This is. Uh oh, wait a minute. This, this will come in here in a minute. Michael, we're not getting the sound.
Wow. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the beauty of music and most of all for the great truth in what you have done for us. And in this season of the year, we turn again to you day by day, very aware, Lord, that we are awaiting your return that this life is but a short wisp of our eternal life. Lord, help us to live in a way that looks to you day by day and reminds us that we are truly citizens of heaven. We are citizens of eternity, that in fact we will live forever. Lord, may we live our life in such a way that uh, the adjustment to heaven uh, is less uh, difficult than it might be. Lord, fill us with your spirit as we seek to serve you and to love you in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Why? Why are some in there? They, yeah, I looked. I looked. I looked.